So let me take a moment uh, to introduce Professor John Dorst. Uh, John arrived at the University of Wyoming in 1983, even though he doesn't look that old to me. Uh, after finishing his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, he worked there in folklore studies, and upon arrival at UW, he became part of the backbone of the American Studies program. He teaches both in its undergraduate and its graduate program, and there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of students uh, from around the world who owe the fact that they managed to complete their master's dissertation to John. Uh, in many ways, John embodies the multiple approaches uh, that are promoted uh, by American studies and by folklore studies. While his first uh, book was on the rise in mythology of American suburbia, his second focused on the character and uh, ideology in many ways of the American West and what it represented for our country. Uh, his Western interests have come to fore in essays such as Getting to the Top, the Making of the Devil's Tower National Monument, and Watch for Falling Bison, the Buffalo Hunt as a Museum Trope and Ecological Allegory. Uh, Professor Dorst has received a Fulbright Lectureship and was honored as a UW Presidential Speaker. In 2002 to 2003, he received a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, which he used to, to curate the exhibit Framing the Wild, animals on display, and that was a featured exhibit both here in this museum and at the University of Wyoming's Art Museum. Uh, Professor Dorse's presence has been influential in organizations around the state, working with the National Museum of Wildlife Art and the Buffalo Bill Historic Center, to say nothing of his service on the board of the Wyoming Territorial Park and the Wyoming Historical Preservation Office. He's done extensive work with our co-sponsor, the Wyoming Humanities Council, serving on their board for six years and even spent a year as president. So uh, today, John is gonna to talk to us about taxidermy. Uh, and his title is The Skin Remembers Taxidermy as Material Memory. Professor Dorst. Thank you, Paul, and let me Second, the thanks to all the sponsoring institutions, uh, and I very much appreciate the invitation to come and come back to the National Mu Museum of Wildlife Art, one of my favorite places in the state. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I thought that, that since the, at, at bottom, this is a Wyoming Humanities Council project, Saturday University, that I'd, I'd try and uh, give a presentation that illustrates what to me is one of the signature features of the humanities, that is the the ability to make connections across different domains of culture, maybe even some extremely uh, remote connections, it would seem like, at first, might seem like remote connections. Um, so that's, that's what I, by the way, um, uh, although uh, there will be 15 minutes at the end of my presentation for a conversation, feel free to interrupt me at any, at any time. Um, I'm hoping we can talk a little bit as I go along here. Uh, so, uh, the, the, there are three things that I want to connect in, in my talk. Um, first of all, as a sort of intro, um, a couple of Alfred Hitchcock films, uh, which I'm going to use as metaphors to get me to uh, a, a broader issue, uh, the issue of the nature of memory uh, and how we, we think about what it means to remember things. And then thirdly, connect all of that to uh, the artisan, artisanal practices of taxidermy. Uh, taxidermy as object and taxidermy as uh, the product of skilled craftspeople. Um, so here in, a, here in a nutshell is where I'm going. Uh, two Alfred Hitchcock films um, uh, have prominently displayed in them taxidermy. There may be others, but those are the two that I know of. Um, and um, but in decidedly contrasting ways. And I want to start with that contrast between how taxidermy is represented in those two Hitchcock films. And then I want to reflect a little bit on this contrast um, as it allows us to make that kind of long-range connection to uh, ideas of memory uh, and what memory means and different versions of what memory might mean for us, most particularly a notion of memory that has to do with its materiality. Uh, the way in which memory is a, not just something in our heads, but is a material, physical thing. And then I want to actually look at the, some of the practices of, of taxidermists uh, as they produce 
these objects that can be understood as kinds of memory in various ways. So I'm going to bounce back and forth a little bit between the concrete and the abstract, uh, between, between the philosophical and the physical, uh, maybe between the sublime and the ridiculous a little bit. Um, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, probably, can I, can I assume that, that many of you could guess what one of these films is that I'm going to talk about? Um, that there's a Hitchcock film that has taxidermy involved in some way, which is, yeah? Psycho, of course, right. Just out of curiosity, everybody seen Psycho at some time in their lives? Yes? No? Not? Only, only a few of you? Shame on you. This is like one of the great classics of American cinema. So, so um, maybe I should say that I'm going to be talking about it as if, since it's over 50 years old, as if you, you know what happens in it. So, spoiler alert, um, I'll be talking about some of the... Uh, some of the conclusions uh, of, of Psycho. But uh, there's a particular scene. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is the scene where Marion Crane, who has stolen some money and fled Phoenix and is on her way to meet up with her boyfriend, uh, of course, stops for the night uh, at the Bates Motel. And uh, she meets Norman Bates, and he, they strike up a conversation, and he brings her some supper and takes her into his parlor in the back room of the motel. And uh, she, this is, these are stills from the moment it, that she enters the room. So we get these cuts back and forth between Marion and uh, taxidermy mouths, birds, around the, around the room. And Norman tells her that he, his hobby is taxidermy. And um, he, they go on to have a conversation in which he, he says that taxidermy is not uh, just a hobby. Uh, it's, it's more than that for him. It doesn't just pass the time for him. It fills his time. With Hitchcock, I, th I think it's safe to say that nothing that you see on the screen is an accident. Uh, he was such a, a master of, of the frame, of the image, and, and controlled every detail in uh, the images of his films. So if we could dwell for a second on, on this sequence where they're having this conversation. Um, and I want to, let me see if I can, yeah, call your attention to this frame and this one and then these three of Norman on this side. And I wonder if I could ask if you notice anything about the setup and the positioning of Norman that seems, I don't know, odd or notable? Or what has Hitchcock done with him in how he's, how he's positioned? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. He has him at one point sit back in his chair so that the bird that's on the wall behind him produces its effect as, as if he has wings coming out of the top of his head or the bird is perched on his head. I, I'm going to suggest, maybe it's a stretch, but I'm going to suggest that that's, that's not an accident. Hitchcock is suggesting something about what's going on in Norman's mind. Of course, we don't know yet uh, what Norman's problems are, but this is, this is a sequence, and you, if you can read the text, which maybe isn't very clear, but it's where Norman tells Marion uh, his backstory. He gives an account of his life, of why his mother has become deranged about the early death of his father. Uh, and we get basically his retelling of his personal story. I want to make a connection between uh, the metaphoric use of taxidermy associated with, with Norman's head and his recollections uh, of his childhood and, and the traumas that were part of it. Real spoiler alert. Um, the climax of the film, uh, we discover that, that Norman obviously is insane and, and has uh, begun to reenact to inhabit the identity of his own mother, who is, uh, as we find out, deceased. Uh, through the whole film, of course, we have uh, assumed that she's roaming around in this creepy house on the hill. And in the scene immediately following this one, uh, of course, Marion has a very unfortunate shower experience. Um, and, 
passes from the scene of the film. One of the striking things about Psycho is that the seeming leading lady disappears or is murdered a third of the way through the film. Um, the, by the way, over Norman's right shoulder is a painting on the wall, and that's the, that's the painting that he takes off, and the peephole is behind that painting that he spies on Marion um, with, as she's getting ready to take the shower, precipitating his mother's uh, maniacal attack. Of course, at the end, we meet Mother um, in the climactic moment of the film. Uh, I'm going to suggest that there's a way in which we can understand Mother as a, an enactment of the, a kind of memory that, that Norman um, has been lost in, become lost in, that a pathological kind of memory, that he has literally recollected his mother. He's gotten her body from the, 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 the grave, and he has, as is said later in the film, preserved her as well as possible. And he has come to uh, merge with her, and this is the moment at which we find out that she is a, a, a corpse. And I want to come back to that later. I won't come back to this slide later. But uh, that idea of him recollecting her physically uh, is uh, a form of recollection, a material form of recollection. Uh, and I want to play out the idea of memory as a kind of physical recollecting, as one version of what, uh, of what memory is. There's another Hitchcock film, the second Hitchcock film, um, that also prominently displays taxidermy, which my, I suspect is going to be less familiar to most of you. Anybody happen to know uh, uh, another film in which taxidermy is prominently on display? No, probably not. Um, the Man Who Knew Too Much, a uh, film from 1955. Actually, it's, uh, he made this, Hitchcock made this film twice. He made a, a version in England in 1935 and then remade it in 1955 with James Stewart and Doris Day. It's in that genre of Hitchcock films that is the international intrigue and international mystery film, uh, all embodied in the form of these taxidermy pieces, as, uh, which of course trades upon probably our general uh, notions about taxidermy, which is that it's just uh, it just got a high creep factor in general, right? I mean, for most of us, many people anyway, um, there's something that's uncanny about it. It has nothing whatever to do with the plot of the rest of the film. Uh, <laughs> it's completely self-contained. It was a complete mistake. Turns out Ambrose Chapel is a place, not this person. Um, and the film picks up from here as they pursue, as they pr hunt for their, their child. Uh, so Hitchcock has inserted this kind of standalone scene in which that play of feelings uh, operates. Um, what I, what I want to suggest, or, or maybe think of this as a metaphor for, is another kind of, of memory. Um, and I want to propose three basic ways to think about memory. There are others, but three that I want to talk about. Uh, memory, to preserve my alliteration here, I'll call it memory as repository, memory as reminiscence, and memory as remembrance. And what, I, what I'll suggest is that these two films, the use of taxidermy in Psycho, is a, a kind of metaphorical reminiscence, as I mean it here. Memory as the culturally shaped ordering of experience into some kind of coherent chronology and narrative that the um, the plot of Psycho is bound up with the recollection, the recollection, and preservation of bodies. Uh, taxidermy is a kind of metaphor for that relationship to memory. Remembrance is memory as a living material process that accumulates within us as a series of mechanisms wound up and ready to evoke feelings and provoke action. I take that. Uh, concept of memory from the early 20th century French philosopher Henri Bergson, who was um, one, of the, one of the early 20th century uh, philosophers who was moving in a direction away from our long-standing inheritance of the notion that mind and body are two entirely separate things. That enli enlightenment heritage that sees the mind operating over here and the material world in our bodies operating in a separate, separate sphere. Uh, Bergson and, and many since him 
uh, proposed that that division is actually um, a delusion, misleading in many ways. Remembrance is the name for those intense feelings, those material, physical things that come back to us, that don't take on necessarily a narrative form, that aren't organized in coherent ways as with how we reminisce about things, and yet can be thought of as a kind of memory, a memory that's literally sedimented into our physical beings. And uh, I think these two Hitchcock films can be sort of seen as, as metaphors for those two kinds of those two kinds of memory. The third kind, the one I list first there, repository, is maybe the most common understanding of what everyday understanding of what memory is. Memory is a kind of repository of these discrete and fixed thought packages that are housed somewhere in our heads uh, or in other storage facilities that extend our brains. Segue to um, back to taxidermy and to uh, an aspect of taxidermy that we can associate with the, the memory as repository. This is a, the Chadwick Ram. Um, if anybody's been to the uh, Buffalo Bill Historical Center, the, the firearms museum there, you can see the original mount of this trophy. Uh, the Chadwick Ram is, uh, some people believe, the single most perfect animal trophy in North America, ever taken uh, in North America, is the Stone's Sheep. And in the uh, system of scoring of trophies that is managed by the Boone and Crockett Club, which maybe some of you know about, um, it keeps the, the, the standard records of trophies of, of the, I think, 36 big game species, the trophy species in North America, of which stone sheep is one. And this is the scoring sheet by which the, the calculation of the trophy value of the Chadwick Ram is presented. Its trophy value, in this sense, is based upon meticulous measurements of features of the animal body, particularly horns and antlers in, in those species. So in this case, for sheep, you have the measurements that are indicated on the upper right in the slide. Uh, the way it works is that the uh, length of the horns are measured, their circumference at four points along their length, the widest points of the horns, and the, the distance between the tips of the horns. Those measurements are all added together to come up with a gross trophy score. Any discrepancies between the two sides, the two, the two horns, is then subtracted from that growth score to come up with the final trophy value. Uh, in the case of the Chadwick Ram, I think the discrepancy is only five-eighths of an inch among all those measurements. Uh, so in other words, it's almost unbelievably symmetrical. So the horns are not only massively large, but they are perfect in, in their symmetricality. And that means that it has a very high Boone and Crockett score. The, you might say, reduction of the Chadwick Ram, first as a living creature, and then as a trophy, and then as a score in a table of scores, is an example of the, a, a, kind of an extreme example of turning uh, the living creature into a kind of memory, a kind of repository uh, entry in purely uh, uh, numerical form. So it's, uh, the Chadwick Ram as a trophy in the Boone and Crockett system is an example of that kind of memory in, in an extreme way. But I'm more interested in the, uh, the other two kinds of memory as it relates to taxidermy, and particularly thinking about remembrance as it relates to the materiality of taxidermy and, and the artisanship of taxidermists. Um, here, th th this is um, the taxidermy studio of Charlie Thompson, who's a taxidermist in Laramie, uh, a, a very experienced and, and master taxidermist. And here he's in the process of, of mounting a bighorn, bighorn sheep. Here, right at the beginning. The only thing uh, from the organic animal 
that is involved in this mount is the, is the horns. The horns and a, the skull cap where they're attached. Everything else is artificial, except of course for the skin that's gonna go over the top. Um, what I wanna suggest here is that remembrance can be understood as the collaboration or the distributed experience of multiple bodies and multiple artifacts. That memory in that sense is not just a package that we can think of as inhabiting or residing in a brain or another kind of repository, but memory as a living process that transcends things like the moment of the death of the animal. That in the material remains of the creature, most notably its horns, there is sedimented, there is accumulated uh, the animal's life. And in that sense, the trophy mount remembers the animal as that kind of bodily remembrance. And to say that skin remembers, that, that's, a, that's a term that comes from Mr. Thompson. He says that the skins of animals, the mount, have in a way woven into them as part of their very fabric inclinations to do things and that those inclinations don't disappear even after the hide has been fleshed and thinned and uh, uh, manipulated in all sorts of other ways that it preserves the inclinations to drape in certain ways to fold to bend to crease in ways that come from the life of the animal itself. The same way that the horns reflect the, the growth process of the creature in life. And that those, uh, that those processes are not gone, that they are remembered as, as a remembrance in the artifact is the, is the argument I want, I'm proposing here. And that we can't restrict our understanding of memory to just those isolated things in our heads, but we should also imagine memory as this distributed process that includes a whole chain of ongoing things, uh, most notably in this, these moments, the interaction between a seemingly inanimate thing and the hands and body of the artisan. That the craftsperson, the taxidermist, is not just making something, his actions are a process of memory. He is remembering the, the creature as this, and, and facilitating the skin's memory as he mounts it, that the, the animal and his practice, his development of his skill, which is a bodily thing, is a mutual transaction between his self, his body, and the inanimate objects that go into the taxidermy mount and the living animal that is no longer alive. Uh, that, that extension of memory beyond just the person, just the mind of uh, the taxidermist is um, my main point here. That distinction between, between recollection, uh, be be between reminiscence, which in a way shaves away a lot of the uh, materiality and the emotional intensities of memory, to make stories that we can call up versus remembrance in this more material sense. Yeah. The hunter, who is L.S. Chadwick, this, this um, not this one, but the Chadwick Ram, was taken in 1936. And his hunting journal, his account of the hunt, is a kind of reminiscence, but it folds into this larger process that pr eventually produces the, the trophy itself, produces the entry into the Boone and Crockett Register, that all of those things are part and parcel of a, a, a network, a web of remembrance. So yeah, the, the act of hunting, the act of taking, the act of killing the animal is part of memory in, the, in this sense of memory. Yeah. And, and as far as organic materials are concerned, uh, it seems that there's DNA in all of us and the, the mere presence of DNA uh, a, a form of recollection. Yeah. Uh, it, it, also, to the extent that it could be mutated and 
dolly the sheep yeah. or dolly the babe and dolly the mom. And anyway, yeah. the baby didn't live as long as the sheep should because it remembered its DNA. I see it, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say absolutely. And, and uh, that's a notion that, that Bergson would very much endorse, that idea that, that he, when he says that uh, memories are wound up in our, very, in our very bodies, there's a way in which DNA, our, our, DNA, our DNA template is, uh, is exactly that. That we live, in a way, we live the memory of our species in our own beings, in our own bodies, in our own lives. And the memory of our parents, and et cetera. Right, right. Uh, but I'd like to expand that just a little bit to the thought of uh, inorganic materials. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I don't know if you classify DNA type memory as being active or inactive, and I suppose if you took a funerary jug, not the contents of it, mm -hmm. but an Egyptian jug with the paintings on it and right. everything, uh, certainly that's a form of memory too, although an inactive form by the time it's found in a grave. Yeah, yeah, and maybe, maybe this is an issue that will come up in, in Ruth's talk in, in a little bit here. But yeah, I, I would say that, that that, well, we can see that in many different ways. The craft of making the pot, for one thing, is consistent with the materiality of memory as I'm talking about here. But it's also like, a, a, in some ways, parallel to a, a trophy. It is a, a, an aid memoir. It's, an, it's a memory object that can re-evoke stories, re-evoke um, sort of a, a formulated sense of an identity that goes along with that funerary object, something like that. Um, I would say that as far as the inanimate things that are, that are involved, that things even like the, um, the polymer forms that now are standard elements of taxidermy, themselves, as inert as they are, are in a way active participants, agents in the process. They have been made through casting processes, many of them uh, either uh, molded on the bodies of, of actual animals, or closely sculpted after those bodies. Uh, so as plastic and art artificial as they seem, in that sense of remembrance, they are, they are memories. They are part of a memory process that's active, that's living, that's ongoing, and, and extends in long chains of connection. Um, and just as, 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 a, as a last uh, note, I mean, I've got this slide here, because the motions, as an example of the motions of the taxidermist, the physical gestures of the taxidermist as continuous with the material thing that he's producing, uh, that those, uh, the beautiful uh, waves of, of horn uh, from the animal are in a way continuous, part of the continuous movement of memory uh, and they flow into the taxidermist's hand in a way. Um, as, he, as he produces the, the mount. Um, maybe this is a place to, to suggest breaking down these, these distinctions that I've proposed here, especially the distinction between reminiscence and remembrance, because I think to go back to Mother in, um, in Psycho, uh, she is a, a kind of taxidermied piece that, that has been the basis of Norman's reminiscence, which he pathologically acts out and dramatizes, dramatizes his mother. But uh, she is also a uh, part of a ongoing remembrance process for Norman. And, and the charge of emotion that we get at the end of that film when Marion goes down to the basement, not Marion, Marion's uh, sister, goes down to the basement and thinks she's meeting mother and turns her around and finds this cadaver. Um, that that intense feeling that we get at that moment in the film is a kind of remembrance. It's a participation in Norman's uh, pathology. Uh, participation in not just his recollections, but in his physical, visceral um, enactment and merging, physical merging with his mother that is central to his pathology. This is, this is the Chadwick Ram again, although now a replica version of it. And the, the horns here are artificial, artificial horns cast from the original horns of the Chadwick Ram. Uh, the body, of course, has been restored. The original mount is just a four-quarters mount of the original animal. This recreation does, in taxidermy parlance, 
produces a uh, life-size mount. Um, this was on display in the Framing the Wild exhibit that was here at the museum uh, 10 years or so ago. And I think we can extend that notion of remembrance to things like replica, uh, that the, the replica of the Chadwick Ram is just another link in this chain of, of remembering and a link in uh, the chain of a kind of conception of, of memory that breaks down the body-mind distinction uh, that, to me, seems like a useful uh, way to, to think about how memory operates in all sorts of spheres of our lives, uh, even something as basic as sitting in a chair. Um, anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and see if you have any other questions or... Yeah. I presume Durham comes from Durham. Right. What's the rest of the word? Yeah, translates, taxidermy translates basically as, as arranging or moving skin. So it, it literally describes the activity of arrangement of skin on some supporting structure. Uh, and and uh, uh, the larger project that this is a part of, um, the, sort of the title for that, is, is Moving Skin, um, playing on the idea that, that the taxidermist literally physically does this material thing of arranging a skin, but that, that produces moving effects in various ways. Um, it, it, it both moves across the boundaries between the animate and the inanimate, um, and it can be moving to us, whether we find it beautiful, whether we find it um, disturbing, um, for some people repulsive, for other people um, some of the most beautiful uh, things imaginable. So uh, moving skin is a very convenient uh, uh, term for, for my argument about taxidermy and memory. That's nostalgia. Um, that yeah. is evoking a memory of something that isn't there and never was there. Okay. Yeah. Yearning for something that has never been. Yeah. There. Yeah. And and that's a that's a, that's a nice point. And and it, it there's there's a form of nostalgia that we could see as falling under the broad category of reminiscence that we. We are nostalgic for things that we at least think we remember, right? Like Grandma and Grandpa's farm or something like that. That was a real thing, but our memories have transformed them into these things loaded with emotional attachment. Uh, so nostalgia is a nice example of the collapse between the distinction of, between reminiscence and remembrance as I'm using it here. And I guess that would be... Uh, another major point I want to make is that when I say those, those ideas of memory are not mutually exclusive, that's what I mean, is, is that when you start thinking about one more closely, it merges into the other conception. So it's kind of an artificial distinction to say reminiscence is just the kind of formulated narrative memories that we have versus the non-narrative emotional material memories that we have. Those two things are constantly blending together. What about the cultural distinction between societies that live from animals uh, and the transition point when taxidermy or some kind of visual, physical preservation of the animal as a whole occurs? This has been interesting work by anthropologists on memory in, um, in some indigenous cultures in which uh, memory is something that actually only happens and only is possible in action. That, that what, what we think of memory as uh, something that is somehow already there, is sort of established and uh, objectified in some way, that thing, that, the package that can be in our head. Uh, there are other cultural contexts in which that's not the understanding of what memory is at all. The memory is, in fact, much more understood as that ongoing material action. Uh, so the, the recollection, the memory, for example, of um, pathways through a forest are not just pre-wired or pre, uh, you know, prescribed in somebody's head. They are remembered as they are enacted by people traversing them, walking those paths. 
that that's literally what memory is. Um, uh, anthropologist Tim Ingold has written interestingly about that phenomenon. A completely different relationship to memory than our, our mostly Western cultural understandings of what memory is. So I don't know if that answers your question, but absolutely uh, cultural variation in relationship and, and conception, or even um, the, the existence of a, a, an isolated concept of memory um, is variable, it's not fixed. Yes? You know, I often think about predominant memories. Uh, if, for example, you're looking back uh, to the remembrance of your parents, and of course you've known them over a span of years, and selectively, I guess in my case, anyhow, I want to pick out certain times, uh, say when they were in their 40s versus the end of life when they were so debilitated. And um, I, I often think, which is the most important for me to retain? Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess all of it, but still, you tend to focus on a certain period. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that would be consistent with, with that reminiscence aspect of memory, because it, it's in the nature of reminiscence that we basically edit our experience of people of our own lives, right? We select those things that seem valuable to us, that are important, that we want, want to remember. Those are the things that, that get edited into things like stories or distinct images. It goes along with the idea of, of nostalgia. Um, so that, that, I mean, in, in the case of Norman, he is uh, reminiscing through his own body about his relationship with his mother. Uh, so that, that process that all of us participate in, and, and we do it both in our own heads as we see it, but also through um, all sorts of other media, right? Our, our family photo albums, our selections, you might say, uh, visual representation, visual memories, our particular moments, particular uh, experiences from our past lives. So we've, we've edited the flow of our experience to create these things that we can call up as reminiscences. And, and that's, that's the distinction between remembrance and reminiscence. Reminiscence is that process of editing uh, a picture of our experience versus the things that are, that are not edited, that, that come back to us unbidden, that maybe come as a rush of emotion, for example, that, that we feel on our pulses. Um, again, Remembering a story or an image of a loved one, for example, can, do, can produce that effect, too. So there, too, the distinction between reminiscence and remembrance breaks down. But yeah, I think we all, and that, I think that notion of, of memory um, is a dominant one for most of us. That's what we think of when we hear the word memory, I think, in just our everyday understandings of the word. Yes. John, where do you place the taxidermy or the creative taxidermy of something like the jackal in this? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a whole other sphere of, sphere of taxidermy, the, the, the kind of non naturalistic taxidermy or the fantasy taxidermy or. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I would say that, that there's, there's a way in, in this understanding of remembrance, there's a way to think about remembering things that, that literally never existed in the genetics and that are mythological. We can remember fantasy, right? Um, that um, the more, uh, the other notions of memory don't include. Um, and I would say that there has been a kind of boom in taxidermy being used in recent years, being used in um, not just the jack jackalope kind of comic way, but in all sorts of avant-garde art, um, uh, the kind of <coughs> material uh, highlighting of the process of taxidermy to produce artistic effects and, and emotions and feelings. There's a whole school in the 90s called the School of Botched Taxidermy. Um, pieces, art pieces and installations that intentionally 
showed the seams, you might say, in, the ta in taxidermy to make a political point or to produce a particular feeling. So, yeah, I think Jackalope is, is under, understandable in terms of, especially in terms of this idea of remembrance. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, watch taxidermy and artistic. Do they use um, fake skins? Um, well, it, there's a whole array of different versions of this. Some use actual skins, um, actual and, and actual taxidermy techniques. There's a uh, an art collective in the Twin Cities called the Minnesota Association of Rogue Taxidermists, I think. Yeah, and and they all work in in um, the the medium of animals. Some of them literally taxidermy, fan fantasy taxidermy in a different way than the jackalope. Um, others literally have uh, um, like the taxidermy opened up and pretty disturbingly opened up for inspection. Um, others use fake skins or use literally um, plush toy skins to produce fake, fake fantasy animals. Um, so there's a, there's a whole huge now, a huge spectrum of the invocations of the, of the non-human animal and the use of their body parts either fake or real. Yeah. Um, what we see here, this exhibit, would be an example of reminiscence, is that right? Yeah. Because uh -huh. there's no repository. I have no repository of memory about that animal. I don't even know what it is. Yeah. Um, and there's no remembrance because I have no emotion. Connection to it, yeah. Except maybe repulsion that somebody shot it. Yeah. There. Yeah. So it's really uh, just what it says is it's a cultural narrative saying we rule, we rule the wild. Yeah, I mean that's that, that's absolutely that's a, uh, certainly one one dimension of what I think you could consider an aspect of reminiscence of, of that kind of memory. Um, that and it, it maybe for some people would go along with the reduction of the animal into this completely abstract cipher literally, in the record book, uh, which is, in some ways, the most extreme form of domination, if we want to see it that way, you know, the absolute control um, uh, of a creature reduced it as a memory to just this number. Uh, although I would say that, that um, in, the, in the material features of this object, that there is also to be seen a kind of remembrance process going on, simply because it's the product of artisanal production, that that taxidermist uh, and the, whoever um, reproduced the horns for this replica was physically engaged in that material remembrance sort of way. So you're right that, that uh, in a particular context, one or the other of these ways of thinking about memory seems more appropriate uh, or more applicable. And the museum exhibit is more like, in many respects, more like a reminiscence relationship to, to animals. But if we think harder about that, we can see ways in which aspects of re remembrance come into it as well. Yeah. As far as repository, the Boone and Crockett Club, to my understanding, came about to document <coughs> the loss of these game species, many of which were being driven to the point of extinction, yeah. whether it was because of market hunting, meat hunting and so forth, and there was a nostalgic sense of loss that many of these animals were going to be lost. So one could argue whether or not their um, um, prioritization of symmetry or their scoring system was accurate, but the or original intent, again as I understand it, was to document how grand these animals were so that you had more um, accurate record keeping than what you might find in the fossil record from, from centuries ago and so forth was to find out what was still remaining a hundred years ago and to document it. And then if anything, it's become a celebration of the North American uh, game management model, how we are producing uh, not only in distribution and, and, and volume of numbers, but that we are have an adequate area for the animals to mature and to become their best representation of that species. Yeah. I don't at all mean to dismiss the Boone and Crockett Club or reduce it to just its trophy records. 
Yeah, the, the Boone and Crockett Club did originate in 1887, I think. Teddy Roosevelt, George Bernard Allen, a bunch of prominent folks, precisely to promote conservation of these species. Uh, and, and so what you're describing, what you're talking about, is the, the, and, and is, continues to be a central mission of the Boone and Crockett Club, the promotion of fair chase hunting and the preservation of habitat and species, game species. Um, so uh, thinking about that institution is a, a piece we can add to our understanding of memory as I'm talking about it here. It's not just even people and objects involved in this ongoing chain of processes, but institutions and larger social contexts are involved in the memory process understood in this way. So you're absolutely right, I think, that, that, that looked at more broadly, the Boone and Crockett Club is an active participant in uh, the material memory of, of taxidermy, of, so even of something like this. This, this belongs to the, the Boone and Crockett Club they commissioned this replica mount as well, um, and it travels, it travels around. So yeah, thank you for that point, it's important. Okay, John, thank you very much.